These frenzied scenes could be the victory rally of a politician. Or perhaps a grand birthday party for a Hollywood film star. Actually, the man at the center of all this attention is King Constantine of Greece. But Greece has been a republic for nearly 30 years. These scenes of rampant royalism and fervor are not in Athens, but in London, where the king lives in exile. Constantine is the king who lost his throne. A royal wedding reception. Crown Prince Pavlos, the eldest son of King Constantine of Greece, is marrying Marie Chantal Miller, daughter of one of the world's richest men. It's a royal watcher's paradise. The guests at this royal wedding are a who's who of the great and the good. To prepare the whole thing was quite difficult, and um, but it was a very uh, enjoyable day, I must say. I, I enjoyed every moment of it. It was great fun. The whole family was there. The whole family is the cream of European royalty. Many are known as the relatives. Um, your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, Your Highnesses, ladies and gentlemen, can I just have your attention for a minute? Everybody has a number who is in the photographs, and it's on this board, and there's another board next door. As you know, um, the Queen is the godmother of uh, our daughter, and uh, Prince Charles is the godfather of my son, and I'm the godfather of his son, and so it's all very close. Society photographer Lord Litchfield pushes protocol aside for practicality, as monarchs and heads of state are herded into place. That's lovely. OK, fine. Stay still. Wonderful. Straight the camera. Everybody, now. That's it. OK. Because I can't see Prince Wales. Uh, that's lovely. Could you all look at me? After the wedding, royal guests will head back to the comfort of palaces all over Europe. But King Constantine will not be traveling home to Greece or even going home to a palace. I've forgotten this is what With his wife, Queen Anne-Marie, the king's home for the past 30 years has been here in a North London suburb. Mm. This is a famous uh, uh, a drawing of my grandfather, where, who was commander chief of the Greek uh, armed forces um, in the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913. He's just receiving a telegram on the victory uh, against the enemy in a naval battle. Constantine is a man whose ancestors fought battles and liberated cities. In his house, it's hard to forget the past. Royal relics tell potent tales of Greek history and hold painful memories of how things might have been. And that's my grandfather, King Constantine. And you can barely see that it's a Laszlo painting. You can barely see he's got a, a black band because his uh, father had been assassinated, King George I of Greece. King George I, as you know, was the brother of Queen Alexandra and Empress Marie of Russia. And that's uh, my grandfather's mother, my great-grandmother, Queen Olga. And this uh, bracelet has uh, gone down through the generations and was stolen from my wife at Geneva Airport. It's a, it's a ruby and um, a ruby and a sapphire. And, a sapphire. and we're trying to persuade the authorities now to uh, try and find them. <laughs> That's my mother. And these two are of King George I of Greece. That was as a, as a young man, just after he came to Greece from Denmark. And that's in, in later life. This is the Queen uh, when she came as Princess Elizabeth, Prince Philip. They came to Greece 
And this is taken at the cafe in uh, Cape Sunyan. There's my father. And that's um, Prince Philip's sister, married to my mother's uh, brother, Prince George of Hanover. And that's his two sons, Prince Carlo of Hessen and Prince Rainer. This sweet little boy here is me. This was painted by the Prince of Wales. It's the island of Crete. Uh, and he painted from the Britannia as they were passing uh, on his honeymoon. And this is painted by him at Mount Athos, and it's one of the monasteries. So I think it's very beautiful. And you can see the evolution of the painter. That's it. <laughs> 40 years ago, things were going to be very different. Thousands of Greeks lined the streets as the young, handsome king, a national hero for winning an Olympic gold medal, married a beautiful princess from Denmark. The future must have seemed so certain. But this fairy tale beginning was to go wrong, and it would lead to the end of over 100 years of Greek royalty. So how did a family with such impeccable credentials, such an illustrious ancestry, come to lose everything? Crown Prince Constantine was selected to represent Greece in the Rome Olympics of 1960. Here he is leading the team at the opening ceremony. His sport was sailing. His boyhood friend, Costas, remembers the prince when they were still at school together. He always wanted to do things for the good of a team. I was in charge of the athletics team. And perhaps sometimes I needed somebody uh, to participate who uh, would only get one point, come fifth or sixth. He always volunteered. He was a real sportsman. We hoped going to the Olympics that if we were lucky and if we could be working very well, we might get a sixth place. This was our aim, not to really humiliate our country. Uh, we never expected we were going to win the gold medal. Wonderful. I mean, it, we, we felt fantastic. And the idea of getting up onto the podium and having the medal put around you and seeing the Greek flag go up and listening to the Greek national anthem was, uh, uh, I always say, say that that was the best feeling in my life uh, other than getting engaged. So, I mean, that was a fantastic situation. Gold medal or not, King Constantine has not been welcome in Greece for half his lifetime. Unlike the boat in which he won gold, which is the pride of the Greek Yacht Club in Piraeus. It brings up back a lot of memories. I was with my crew this afternoon, and we were talking about it, and we thought of actually putting the boat into the water one day and having a go. But she's lovely. She's absolutely beautiful. Back at the club for the first time since he was exiled in 1967, it's an emotional time for Constantine. I have been waiting uh, exactly 36 years to be able to say to Isaf, Welcome to the club of which I am a member. And welcome to the club that I have the honor of being admiral of. Nearly half a century earlier, the gold medal winning Crown Prince was greeted by his father, King Paul, on the tarmac at Athens Airport. Constantine was hailed by his country as a national hero. We estimated, the, uh, because it was the first medal in 50 years, I think they were estimating something about a million and a half people came into the streets uh, and were cheering, the two members of my crew and myself. To win a gold medal is an incredible thing. 
And for the Crown Prince at that time to win a gold medal was an amazing thing. And uh, you can never take that away from you. You can take almost anything away from a person, but you can never take his gold medal away. Just about everything else was taken away from him. 26 kilometers north of Athens is a 10,000 acre estate called Tatoi. At its center is this house, which has been unoccupied since December 1967. It was once the family home to generations of the kings and queens of Greece. Constantine was only 27 and on the throne for less than three years when the nightmare of every monarch came true. Overthrow of the established order by military force. We were here, the, uh, the queen was expecting our eldest son. And um, well, uh, we heard about it about two o'clock at night. And um, I called my aide who lived in the house up there and he came down, knocked, knocked on this door lovely old door and um, I just went to the telephone and tried to find out what was going on and tried to call the government and the government had been arrested and tried to call different commanders. Telephone lines were being cut all the time. And then we heard that the tanks had reached the gate so I sent my security officers to go and call the commanding officer of the tank uh, uh, squadron that had come up here to come and speak to me but they just arrested my uh, security officers, so I realized that they had very unfriendly intentions. And I asked my security to withdraw up till here. There are only about 20 men. And we, they had, on that uh, bit there, they had about, I think, four submachine guns and a uh, couple of revolvers, but that's about it. Were, were you afraid for, no. for your life? No. I mean, you don't have time for that. I mean, you have to, uh, you're so busy. You have to be on the television, try and work out what's going on. And, try to solve the, the problem. And then I went down to the military headquarters to try and work out um, what to do next and how to get my country out of this mess. This mess was a result of Greek politics in the mid-1960s, which were in turmoil. The coup came about a month before a general election, where a left-wing victory was certain. Afraid of civil chaos and their own loss of political power, a section of the army, led by a brigadier and two colonels, took the country by force. Over 10,000 people were arrested. The former King Constantine has never talked in detail about those dangerous days and rarely gives interviews. I was invited to meet him at his home in North London. Can you explain to us, in, in the most simple and straightforward terms possible, what exactly happened in 1967? It's the most ghastly feeling you can have to see your country disintegrate in front of your eyes um, within hours. My whole aim that day um, was to try and find a system whereby we wouldn't end up killing each other and into civil war. We had just been through all that in the 40s. And I tried to find a way to solve this problem um, without getting any blood spilled. Not an easy task. The king's strategy surprised many. This formal photograph was taken just after the coup, when Constantine, still as official head of state, swore in the colonels as the new legitimate government. Many people have wondered that maybe you gave uh, the new government after the coup a sense of legitimacy by recognizing them. Um, how would you answer those critics? Well, um... The legitimacy came because I swore in the government uh, that day. Um, and the reason I swore that government in that day is that I felt that if I didn't do that uh, and then try to gain time uh, after the uh, swearing in, we would go into, as I said before, a possibility of a civil uh, strife between the military units. The prime minister of the day, who was arrested also, I managed to get him out of his... Uh, confinement and I forced the colonels to release him because I wanted to talk to him and get his advice. And um, he also thought that maybe I should uh, arrest all these people. So I said to him, look, how do you expect me to, to arrest them? I don't have any units at my disposal. How am I going to, I can't physically arrest them. 
Um, he said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, what I thought I'd do is uh, swear in a government with as few military people as possible, more civilians as possible, and then try to gain time to organize a counter coup and, and go to democracy. <clears throat> and he said, well, I suspect that that's probably the only sensible way of going about it. Many people say that the king should have used his rights actually to dismiss the military regime, not to put up with it, and if necessary, actually draw his pistol on uh, officers who were um, creating a revolutionary situation against the uh, established order. Military commanders and political leaders were among those arrested within hours of the colonel's coup. The king was alone. What were the options open to him? It's very easy with hindsight or even from the sidelines to criticize somebody for what they did or didn't do. I, I feel that the king always acted rightly, but in, in an extraordinarily difficult situation. You expected some sacrifice from your king, and the sacrifice would have been not necessarily to expose his life or to expose to his family to any danger, but to stand up and say, no, I do not accept this military coup. In fact, he did the opposite. Constantine claims he did the opposite to create a smokescreen to mask his real intentions of a fight back against the coup. But exposed to the harsh glare of international newsreels, his behavior looked like collaboration. Cracking eggs at Easter, the king appeared to be on best terms with the military junta. He says his mindset was very different. Somebody asked me one day, when did I plan to overthrow them? And I said 10 minutes after I heard that they were making the coup which was 10 o'clock, uh, 2 o'clock in the morning. From day one, he was thinking, how can I extricate myself from this situation? How can I actually save Greece from this fate? The trouble uh, with making a coup is that you have to have a devious mind. And um, the generals, the senior generals and myself hadn't a clue of how to do this. So it was a really an improvised situation. He had one card in his hand. If he didn't trump them, he lost. It took me eight months to try and set it all up. And then in December, before Christmas, on the 13th of December, uh, I moved and uh, tried to overthrow the colonels. It didn't succeed, so I had to leave the country and then went into exile. I chose to leave for the simple reason that if I did stay, it would end up with military units shooting at each other a brother killing brother, father killing son. There was no purpose in that. If my efforts to overthrow the colonels and restore democracy were to be successful, then they had to be successful in the first two hours. You can't drag that sort of thing on. If you could wind back the clock, being a, an older and much wiser man, is there anything you would have done differently? I would have done most of the things the same way, but far better. We've got that here. In the small hours of a chilly Thursday, the 14th of December, 1967, the Greek royal family fled into exile. The royal plane landed in Rome with only five minutes of fuel remaining. The family took few possessions with them. Though few people knew, the Queen was in the early stages of pregnancy. Under intense media scrutiny, the King maintained his characteristic silence. In a strange country, cut off from all that was familiar, the royal refugees had little idea of what the future might hold. Will you stay here? Do sit at the back. An old friend of the king remembers this stressful time well. I went to Rome, tried to find him, and uh, rang the bell, not knowing what to expect. And he opened the door. Um, it was very moving. I was very moved. He was very moved. Uh, he thought that I was arrested but I was not. And it was a very difficult moment of his life because it was the night, the day that um, the queen had lost a baby. She was uh, expecting when she left on the 13th of December from Greece, and she lost that baby on the 16th. 
we decided to stay in Rome initially because that's uh, enough fuel that I had in my plane when I left Greece. I couldn't go any further. So we landed there, and so I wanted symbolically to show the Greek people that while they were under dictatorship, we were, they were not forgotten, and we would work for their freedom. Two weeks after his failed fight back, newsreel cameras recorded this. The royal family, apparently without a care in the world, enjoying Christmas at the Greek ambassador's residence in Rome. This show of normality might have fitted with royal protocol, but it wasn't doing the king's image any favours. The next step you would have expected from the king of Greece, from a king of any country, was to condemn the status quo existing in his country. He never did that while he was in exile, while he was abroad. And that counts a lot. That counts a lot. As time passed, the colonel's junta tightened its grip and became increasingly brutal, crushing any opposition. Gruesome stories of torture and oppression emerged. There were worldwide protests. The king in exile remained silent. Finally, in July 1973, the military regime declared that Greece was now a republic and the king was formally deposed. Once they abolished the monarchy, I had to uh, find means of my, for survival. And uh, so uh, I left Rome and the family went initially to Denmark. I came to London to find a, a place to stay. And then the whole family joined me here and we've been here since uh, 19, well, the end of 1974 really. You mentioned the, a means for survival. Uh, that's an intriguing point. I mean, I, I have no idea what a person in your situation uh, does for sustenance. What do you do to support yourself and, you, and your family? It's difficult. Um, it's difficult, but um, slowly, slowly, one uh, has to adapt and one, one has to find means of, of, of doing that. But uh, initially, it was quite a problem, but uh, these things happen. I, and are you willing to tell me how you overcame the problems and, and what you well, did? Well, it, it's, uh, it's very private, that. So, but um, we, we managed to survive. <laughs> In 1974, the king and queen settled into the Surrey village of Chobham with their three children, Alexia, Pavlos and Niklaus. Later that same year, the junta collapsed. Naturally, the Greek royal family were optimistic about a return to Greece. But the new democratic government ordered a referendum on the future of the constitution and the monarchy. Claiming it might cause civil unrest, the new prime minister said he would telephone the king when he could return. The call never came, and the king campaigned from exile in England. Greece voted two to one for the abolition of the monarchy. Up until you lost your place in Greek life, how did you feel your relationship was with the public? Uh, it was very much the same as it is in England. I mean, in all the big uh, uh, state functions and uh, going, let's say, on uh, the national days, there were huge crowds uh, in the streets identifying the king over the crown at the time. Um, but the circumstances of our life changed, you know, when the dictatorship happened, then I had to leave the country, then I was away from the public for so long. It was very difficult for, the, for me and for them because you can't equate with them. And uh, since the referendum of 1974, he's officially been ex-king of Greece. Although, even today in the court circular, which is published in British newspapers, he's always referred to as King Constantine of the Hellions. Today, the ex-king of the Hellions keeps in touch from England with events in Greece through satellite television. Had technology like this been available during the time of the colonel's coup and the referendum, Greek royal destiny may have been very different. Deposed in 1973 and living in exile ever since, the former king of Greece, Constantine, has never formally renounced his status as a monarch. One of the reasons for this lies deep within a Greek tradition. In the Greek Orthodox tradition, the king is uh, anointed, actually, at his coronation. So once a king, always a king. Um, he will never 
until his dying day, lose his status as a king. But as a reigning king, obviously, at the present time, he's not a reigning king. He's an ex-king. That's his official status. And I think this is a status which he himself accepts. Do you think you are the last king of I Greece? I will run. Do you think that you will indeed be the last king of Greece? <laughs> well, uh, according to uh, the constitution of my country, that is, uh, the, that is the case. <laughs> but according to you? I have no idea what's happening in the future. I, it's very hard to say. The court of King Constantine resides here, on the sixth floor of this London building. It's a far cry from life in a palace. The business of being an ex-king has been conducted from these modest offices since the late 1970s. Constantine still signs with the royal signature. Hello. The king's office receives around 150,000 letters a year, most addressed to his majesty or King Constantine. No surprise, then, that he still thinks he's a king. Always the wish to be very well uh, with his family, and uh, the most important wish for them is to see him in Greece. OK. Just like members of most royal families, the king gets mountains of gifts. All these icons come from uh, uh, members of the public in uh, Greece who come to England and, come and want to come and see me, and then they bring all these different icons as, as a gift. And they come from clergymen or students or just anybody. And they always bring an icon just uh, for protection and blessings. So I keep them here as a collection. The soldiers, are, if my memory serves me correctly, they were collected by uh, Prince Philip. Rather nice, aren't they? It's the Royal Guard. The former King of Greece has redefined his life. Whether he's chauffeuring Queen Elizabeth II on a golf buggy at his son's wedding reception, or joining Prince Philip and other royals on the dance floor, the former King Constantine remains firmly at the centre of the royal merry-go-round. And within this elite group, he plays a vital role. Hang on, boys. King Constantine, as former king of Greece, is one of the most important linchpins in European aristocracy, specifically because he was freed by this uh, exile and by the referendum. How is he used as a linchpin? Well, he's the Clapham Junction of monarchy, which means that his private family occasions became natural gathering pools for everyone to come from Spain, from Denmark, from Britain, um, and it was a good occasion for inter-European royalty to meet. For instance, on his 60th birthday, he invited a number of high-profile guests, including royalty who, who, with whom they're family. One of the two, two people were Prince Charles and uh, Camilla Bowles, and that was the first time that the couple, Charles and Camilla, were seen together in public. Um, it was a, a happy occasion for me, and um, I just asked them if they would uh, join. I mean, you know, it, it was my birthday, and um, he very sweetly um, hosted the, the, the lunch. And so I asked if they would all be there, you know. And, um... But it served its purpose, because after that, the Charles and Camilla train could sort of gather some momentum and perhaps be tested in the media and on the British public. It seems to me that talking to people uh, and uh, reading things but before speaking to you, that you, you occupy a unique position. You're almost a sort of a diplomat, if you like, for European royalty, a behind-the-scenes mover and shaker. I mean, how do you regard your role? Well, uh, <laughs> it's a funny way of putting it. I, I don't feel it that way. I feel that um, they're all my family. And um, I was in, the, in, in a position uh, many years ago. Uh, I'm not in that position now, but I still equate with them, and I can get on with them very well. And it, it's much more, from my point of view, looking at them as a family with the knowledge that they have a very important job to do. 
Um, in the final analysis, what we all try to do is uh, service to the people. That's basically what Monarch is all about. Although he no longer has a throne, there is evidence that Constantine still holds real influence in Greece and that he can provoke the Greek government. In 1993, the family went on a yachting holiday around the Greek islands. Having reportedly agreed to avoid populated areas, he sailed into this port in southern Greece for fuel. The royal party were shadowed by Greek naval destroyers and buzzed by a Hercules aircraft. He was tracked all over the place until he was finally obliged to sail away and not to uh, disturb their peace any longer. Their ner the Greek government's nerves couldn't take him. And that may be why, a year later, the Greek government seized the king's 10,000-acre estate at Tatoi. For the king, returning to Tatoi, the home he was forced to abandon nearly 40 years ago, it's a sentimental journey. Tatoi is now a national park. This was my home. This was where we, this was what I called home. This is where we lived. There's a lot of emotion in, in this uh, whole place because it, it was originally bought by my great-grandfather, uh, King George I, who came to this country from Denmark as a young man of age to about 17 and became uh, the King of the Hellenes, and he reigned for 50 years. It was not bought by money that came to him as uh, a salary. It was come money that came from Denmark. He bought it himself so he could have his own private place. Since it was bought in 1871, the estate at Tatoi has passed down through several generations of the Greek royal family. Since being in exile, Constantine has had to fight to establish his right to his own land. Now we'll come to the sort of last uh, turn before the house. And on the right was where all the vineyards were. And the, my, the stags used to love coming in there. And all this, I don't know what they're, done, they're doing this for. This is just for the public, I don't know what it is. But all this was vineyards, and I had to put up huge fences because they used to go and eat all the grapes. And they would roar like mad in that whole area. And that's, you see down there that, uh, that patch? I don't know if you can see it behind yeah. that lovely tree. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I had my helipad and I used to land my helicopter to come home from my office to have lunch with, uh, with the queen and my little daughter. And then I would fly back again to work. Royal possessions are a bit of a hot potato. Who do they belong? Do they belong to the throne, ergo to the state, or do they belong to the person, which means private possessions? It's difficult to sort of uh, clarify for certain what belongs to whom. Well, maybe not that difficult. Though unoccupied throughout the 1970s and 80s, the king paid ownership tax on Tatoi. So as far as the Greek tax authorities were concerned, it did seem to be his house. It's difficult to describe. I mean, why do they do? Why did they take it away? It's it's very hard to describe. Whether it's uh, spite or envy, I have no idea. I mean, it is really very difficult to understand. There's no logic to it at all. And um, it was an estate that was uh, bought by the family. This is where we live. This was our home. Most of our family were born here, died here. Uh, my son, uh, our son was born here. 
I'm trying to figure out which room was it. He uh, was born. Was uh, it over there? One of the rooms up there. Over he was there. up there, was he? Yeah. And down here is an artificial pond, and there was a... It was a swimming pool. A swimming pool. The pond is underneath here. And uh, there's the swimming pool, which was a, a massive failure. <laughs> Your parents built that, no? Yes, it wasn't very good. And then further down in the, behind the trees is a, a small place where there was a tennis court. It's very thick. All this... You see, all these things... Um, my father used to come out in the mornings every day of his life and clear all the undergrowth, so you could see quite far away. He was asking to be allowed to go to his home, to use his property, not as a palace, but as a private residence. This was deliberately misconstrued by the Greek socialist government as being a threat as being an attempt to return by the back door into Greece. And no amount of um, assurance by the king that that was not his intention seemed to be able to move them. After 10 years of negotiation, paying all taxes and reaching agreement on the house, a new government U-turned and seized Tatoi in 1994. The royal family was stripped of passports and had to apply for Greek citizenship. King Constantine's patience finally snapped. He went to the European Court of Human Rights. I consider it the greatest insult in this world for a Greek to be told that he's uh, not a Greek or that a Greek to be told that he has to apply for Greek nationality. I was born Greek, I am Greek, and I will die Greek. And uh, there are certain things that every human being will not go further. You cannot push an individual further. And that's my limit. I was born in my country. I served in the Greek armed forces. I paid Greek taxes. I won a gold medal for Greece, the first gold medal Greece has ever won in any sport in 50 years. And I became the head of state of Greece. And I think that anything beyond that is totally nonsense. father, that's my mother. And these wreaths, uh, I brought them here in the beginning of March because it was the uh, 40th anniversary of my father's passing away. And um, I had a memorial service, so we put the wreaths here of my family and my sister's family from Spain. And now they'll have to clear them all away because they've all... It looks rather sad. After long deliberation, the European court ruled that the human rights of King Constantine had been violated. Tatoi was his. But he still didn't get the house back, because the ruling allowed for compensation to be paid, rather than returning the king's seized property. And in this um, chapel is buried my grandfather, King Constantine, and also my grandmother, Thank Queen you. Sophia who was the sister of Kaiser Wilhelm. Today, as he walks around his family's graveyard, the king is just a visitor. It's as if the Greek government had wished to wipe royal history from the records. Prince Andrea, if you want, uh, of Greece is uh, there, who's Prince Philip's father. My grandmother's there, who's the sister of the Kaiser. Uh, my great grandfather is there, who is the son of the King of Denmark. So it goes on and Queen Sophia was also the granddaughter of um, Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria. So you see, everybody comes from two, two sides. Denmark, King Christian IX, Britain, Queen Victoria. And they all sort of crisscrossed it up. I mean, it'll, us too. If you get the, the, <laughs> the book of all the families, it'll take you Long time. A long time to work it all out. So I think Prince Andrew is over there. And um, now we'll see my uncle and my parents.
In the spring of 2003, with all five of their children, the king and queen felt able to visit Greece for the first time in nearly 40 years. Having won his case in the European court, King Constantine clearly felt relaxed about returning home. With all disputes resolved, he was keen to test the reaction of the Greek government. I think the case finished in November and we took the plane and went back to Greece in February, uh, which I think took a lot of people by surprise, but at least we broke the ice. I was with them. Everybody in the streets was nice to them. Everybody was, agreed, everybody greeted them. All the media was after them. There were about 10 television cameras following them. So the government could not react anymore. Though apparently relaxed meeting the people of northern Greece, some issues remained unresolved. One of these was that the funds the government used to pay the king in compensation for Tatoi had a political sting in the tail. The thing that upset me a lot was that the compensation that they um, gave me came from a, the budget that deals with natural catastrophes like earthquakes and, and, uh, and floods. And I thought that was uh, perhaps below the belt to take money away from people who would need it because of this sort of catastrophe. We have a request from uh, a village in uh, just north of Arta. It's, uh, there are about four, four or five villages that were very badly affected by earthquake. And, uh, Spurred on by their sense of injustice, the royal family sought a way to get the money back to the Greek disaster fund. They formed a foundation to fund the rebuilding of shattered communities. It's named after the Queen, the Anna Maria Foundation. I mean, I, I would like to see it and then check with the board if they approve the, the amount of money that we want to spend so, and for what. Right. Which, in, which in means, actually, that the sooner we can go to see it, the better. The better. Sure, Absolutely correct. <clears throat> He's developed his life as best he can, but always having as the touchstone what he can offer to Greece and the people of Greece. He remains, to all intents and purposes, their king in waiting if they need him. And there's no doubt that as one of the veterans of the International Olympic Committee, the king helped get the Olympic Games to Greece in 2004. Well, yeah, I, I think he did everything he could. Uh, I know that during the bid, he went to his friends at the IOC, and, and the IOC is a strange group. I'm an IOC member. There's only 120 of us, so it's a very close fraternity. And so, you know, you do have your friends, and he went to them. I'm sure he went to 30 or 40 of them and said, look, at time for Athens. I think he worked very hard. Though looking like an ordinary family out shopping or on a sightseeing trip, even a casual stroll around Athens becomes something of a royal walkabout. When you go back to Greece then, do, do you have any sort of uh, protection? Do you have cordons around you or you just walk down the street? I just walk down the streets. Do people talk to you? Uh, all the time. What do and, they say? Um, and they are very honest about it because they'll come up to you and they'll either cheer you or kiss you or hug you or tell you that they voted against you in the referendum with a big smile on their face. And, uh, you know, you just tell them, well, that's just fine. But, I mean, the only you thing... You tell them it's fine? You don't take that personally? No, no. No, you can't take these things personally. I mean, the, the decision of the people was final, they took it, and that I have to live with that. So um, what am I supposed to do? I can't cry every day. <laughs> these days, the ex-king of Greece travels by tube. Today, he's showing his younger daughter, Theodora, and her friend where he got married in 1964. Here with all the troops lined up, and um, the carriage would came up through here, stop there, and your mother went in through here with her long uh, wedding dress and, uh, what do you call it? Uh, veil. Veil. And then just before she went in, she turned around and waved. <laughs> 
So it was in a way quite strange for me, but it was really beautiful. And what was very moving actually was inside, because all the petals were falling down um, from, from up there. And that's what we tried to emulate for my, both my, my son's and my daughter's wedding, because it was very moving, it just came floating down. And no rice in the church, I mean outside. Driving around the carriage, people were throwing rice all over the place. The horses, I remember, got a little bit excited and started going sideways, which I wasn't too happy about. In the carriage? In the carriage. But at least it was an open carriage, so I thought, well, if anything happens, I can always jump. I hope that when we meet, we'll invite you in the new opening. And maybe when... God knows. If she finds a nice husband, we can have the wedding here. Great, great. For sure, for sure she will find a nice husband. She better. <laughs> for Princess Theodora, there is the tantalizing prospect of a wedding in the same cathedral as her parents. The former king of Greece remains philosophical about his chances of a return to the throne. Uh, it's difficult for... We are not um, politicians. Uh, politicians strive for this chair, strive for this uh, position of power, and they do everything they can to get it. Uh, the very few exceptions of politicians who realize the time is up and they have to leave. Um, I've had this privilege, this, I've had this sense of responsibility before. It's not my aim to try to get it back again. Uh, for me, the predominant uh, thing in my mind is that uh, my country should live in peace, my country should be uh, happy and successful, and my job is to do whatever I can to help it as a private citizen. Constantine could never really be just a private citizen in Greece. When three generations of the monarchy turned up for the first royal christening in Greece for 40 years, it was a media scrum. The brothers Grimm might have the king returning to reclaim his throne, but in the real world of a modern Greek democracy, such a simple fairy tale ending is unlikely. <laughs>